starts. All right, it's already started, so we'll do that afterwards. Okay. <laughs> All right, it's good to be here. Uh, I hope this is working on Facebook. It's got, got a whole new format for live videos, so it's interesting. But I, it says I'm live, so I believe I am. So it's good to have everybody here this weekend. We're thankful for all the rain that we got and uh, hope a lot of other parts of the country did. We always need rain. We're on part 31 of No Penal Substitution. And today we're going to go through the seven vials in the book of Revelation that so many people are afraid of. So uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. I'd like to get through all of it if we can. So if any, is anybody in a hurry, they got to leave really quick. Okay, so I'm going to do my best to get through the whole thing. Uh, last week, I quoted some scripture from Ezekiel, and it, I think it, I was worried that it came across not, not real clear, uh, but where it talks about showing the house, the house, uh, verse 9 said, now let them put away their whoredom and their carcass of their kings far from me, and that says, I will dwell. So there's one of those verses that implies if you do something, God will dwell in you. But they added that word will, and it just says, because I dwell in you. And so that can be really used about, you know, quit going to other things for your source because I dwell in you already. And then it went on down to uh, verse 11 that said that they'd be ashamed of all that they've done. It said, son of man, show the house to house. And then it says, uh, if they be ashamed. In other words, if they're, not, if they're not realizing that they're living as the house of God, they don't realize that we're the dwelling place of God. Then he said, uh, if they're ashamed of that, show them the form of the house, the fashion of the house, the goings out there, the comings in thereof, and all the forms. In other words, show you who you are, talk to you about how you're Christ, the new man. And it says, and write in their sight that they keep the whole form thereof and all the ordinances thereof. And above that, in verse 8, that's the real one I was trying to point out to everybody, because when they translated it, they said that they uh, their abominations... Uh, that, that they had defiled God because it says in my anger and therefore, but what it said is themselves, they had defiled themselves. And because they defiled themselves, what they did consumed them. It had nothing to do with God whatsoever. And where it said in my anger, it was in their violent breath that they did that. And so over and over and over in scripture, we're seeing every place that it looked like God did something, God didn't. It was always something that they did, like the child burning their hand. The parents gave them instruction not to touch the stove, but they burned themselves. They didn't punish them by burning them themselves. So it's all through scripture. So that being said, uh, we kind of started this last week, but now we're going to get into this. I'm going to introduce it a little bit on uh, the vials. If you turn to Revelation 14.8 uh, real quickly. 14.8. And it says, and there followed another angel. Remember, angels are messengers, correct? They're not winged creatures. And we say a lot of these things for new people that might be coming to our videos. But they're messengers. I'm a messenger. You're a messenger. Everybody watching this, the whole world, we're here as a messenger of God's love. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. So another messenger saying, Babylon is falling. And what is Babylon? Confusion. It's confusion, right? By mixture. You know, whenever you preach a message with mixture, it brings much confusion. That's why a lot of people are confused in religious settings today, because there's so much mixture in that. And it said this messenger is, is declaring that that confused message is fallen, says it twice, it's fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, as I pointed out last week, there's one word for wrath, which is, uh, God's passion, God's longing desire, God reaching out for you. But then there's another word for wrath, uh, particularly in verse 8, where it's talking about the vitality. And vitality can be the vitality of the religious system, or it could be vitality from your spirit, depending on what you're drawing from. And that vi vitality from the religious system produces death. It produces a sense of separation from God. So if you live all your life feeling like you're separate from God, that's dead, isn't it? You're, you're always doing dead works. Everything you do produces death, which death is no knowledge of God whatsoever. So that's this religious system. It's from man, as Isaiah said, man whose breath is in his nostrils. They get all their information from the sense realm. But not for long, though. No. Verse 10 says, if you look there, verse 10, the same, uh, those who drink from that religious will, shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. 
I'm going to explain much of that to you, but I want to explain to you the phrase in the presence of. Uh, this is not talking about like we are in one another's presence, right? You know, if I would say I was in the presence of Sandy today and I was in so much awe, <laughs> that just means I was with you. So that kind of explains it a little bit. But when you look it up in the Greek, it comes from the uh, New Testament uh, word optonomiae. It's kind of like ophthalmology or whatever. Uh, it's a number... Uh, 3700 and it means to gaze with wide open eyes at something remarkable and uh, denotes simply not just a voluntary uh, observation but a really intense looking at and discerning from it signifies the earnest uh, but more continuous inspection are watching and so this travailing them in the person is literally uh, us uh, talking about seeing somebody and knowing that they're holy. Because when it says holy angels, holy is saint, it's holy. So in other words, when I look at you, you're a messenger, I realize that you're holy right now. And how can I travail you in birth with the word of God if I don't know that you're already holy? That's what I was trying to explain here. Because if I don't see you as holy, then what do I see you? I see you as a sinner saved by grace. And so when I begin to preach the gospel, then I think that you need to, I mean, excuse me, a sinner, then I think that you need to be saved, right? And so that's what we did for a long time when we understood crucified, died very quick and raised and seated. We thought, what a great revelation this is. I'm going to go use it and go win people, you know, and that's what we did with it. And that's where we were at. There's nothing wrong with it. That's where we were at. But now we have become most holy place priests. I thought I was back then. But we really have become, in a, in a sense, a most holy place priest because now we're seeing something. We're seeing something greater. Now I can go to somebody and say, listen, I want to tell you something. And that's what I did with our brother and sister that's come here, new. I, I, I Right off the bat, I told them that they were holy and they were righteous. And they were when they were born. And everything that, everything that you're struggling with has nothing to do with who you are. And it was so easy. And they came for that, and they will be coming more, and they want that. So it says to do this with uh, in the presence of, but, but also it says in the presence of the Lamb. So in other words, you have an understanding that everyone is holy, but you also have an understanding of what Jesus did, right? And that understanding is what causes you to see everybody holy. So the word wrath here, again, when it pertains to God, it's always his passionate love, his intense and longing for, his desire for you. Uh, it says uh, uh, the natural vitality, though, is can be spiritual vitality also, but it's uh, liveliness, strength, and energy. So where do you get your liveliness, liveliness and strength and energy from? Do you get it from your spirit? Do you get it from knowing that Christ is your life? Or do you get it by what's called filthy rags or religious works? And a lot of our lives, we try to get it from religious works. You know, my strength, and, and before 1996, I loved God, I trusted God, but there, a lot of my strength was in my ability to make money. So if I could make money, I would be happy. But then when I didn't make money, it wasn't there anymore, so it wasn't permanent. And so you can get that from either way. So when we look up on the surface meaning of the word indignation in that, it does not match up with the passion and the love of God. So they translated and used the wrong word for that. Uh, the word is really orge again, and it means his desire, his reaching forth, his excitement of mind, a violent passion for man. Then, of course, Mr. Strong's put punishment in there, but that's not part of that translation. Mm -hmm. So uh, the translators use this word indignation for a reason, didn't they? They wanted people to be afraid. They wanted to enforce a religious system. And again, I say when you're looking and you're translating scripture, uh, most of the books, a lot of the books, that every book that I've ever seen that you've gone to, they either translate it where they always thought it was, or they translate the actual word in the King James Version and not where it came from. So we also know that fire and brimstone are the words for God, and they're not in a bad sense. And we'll look at those in a minute. Most of you know them already in our fellowship. But the word fire in the book of Hebrews, Paul wrote, God is <clears throat> a consuming fire. And then Jeremiah says, does not my word of fire saith the lord and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces when you look at that word rock it's a craggy rock it's pieces of the, well, not even pieces of the rock it's just you know we are the, we are the rock of revelation that god wants to use in the earth but it's been kind of craggy because it's got a lot of religious junk on it or in the ocean barnacles have attached itself to it right 
and we need to be made free from all that. So the rock of which Jeremiah spoke with is uh, the lofty imaginations of man whose breath is in their nostrils, the lofty imagination. And people have really exalted themselves above God, and that's why we have a lot of humanism today. People believe it's just about man only, and they don't, they don't connect God with us, and they don't connect what Jesus did. They think Jesus was just another great teacher, and they want to come up with their own revelation. And those revelations are the, are the craggy part of the rock. They're still in the rock. They're still of God. But there's just a lot of craggy stuff that needs to be, we need to be free from. So the truthful word, though, and I use the word truthful word and also the word undeceitful word. When it talks about the truth will make you free, there's some other verses in there where it talks about the undeceitful word. And we don't want the deceitful word is a word that's mixed with mixture. It deceives you, right? Mm -hmm. And so the King James Bible and all other versions after that, that come from that version, and they still have that mindset, it is deceitful. Not that they're purposely today trying to, to trip us up, but it's kind of like that's been the Bible for hundreds of years, and that's just the way it is. And it's not. It's full of a lot of deceit, a lot of mixture, and a lot of mistranslations. So they become strongholds in people's lives. How many people have you talked to that, that spout out that religious stuff? And you can see it's a real stronghold. And most of the time you can sense that you really shouldn't say anything at all. I was sitting with a Mormon lady the other day. She's sweet as she could be, or on the phone. And I was talking with her, one of our family members of our church, of our funeral home. And it, I could not believe what was coming out of her mouth. It's just, I never heard this about that faith. But they, she was talking about that when you die, you go to the spiritual realm. She didn't even call it heaven. She just said it's a spiritual realm. It's a place that you pay for everything that you did wrong. And, you, and it's a place of learning, a place of suffering. And then you make, have to make another choice. And she said that we made a choice to come here and literally it was like going to hell when we came here to prove our love for God. That's why we came here so we could prove our love for God and most people fell it. And she said that's when babies die, it is a real blessing because they don't have to go through this horrible life here. But where did that come from? It came from religion. You know, she said Jesus gave the guy the Book of Mormon and Jesus told him all this stuff. And well, that's odd because Jesus is nothing but love. <laughs> He came back to restore life to man, you know, to live in our life. He said, I came that you would bring that to, to revivify, if you would, life and life more abundantly right here. Jesus never said anything about going to a place of suffering whatsoever. So that's what religion does. And it's a real craggy stone hold and it destroys, you know. So Jeremiah says the truthful word is like a hammer. The truthful word will come and destroy that. There again, though, you can't give the truthful word to everybody. You've got to discern whether they're hungry or not. And it's not my place to say whether you're ready because then I'm going to judge you as too immature. But I think what helps you in that is you listen. Listen with their spiritual, listen for an opening. And if they say something, you can say, you know, I understand uh, how you feel. I felt that way too. But you mind if I tell you what I found out, feel, felt, found? And if they say yes and you discern it's okay, then it's good to, to, to say that to them. That lady, I said a little bit, but not a lot because I could tell she wasn't ready yet. But the word craggy is rough, rugged, and uneven. You ever walked on an uneven road? I've got a pond that I've been fishing a lot. And <clears throat> when I get down close, the, the, the road's pretty straight. But when I get down where I have to get down to the water, it's all uneven. And, you know, it's, there's, it's not a sure foundation. And it gets the outside of my foot hurting. I guess I've got a bone spur out there. But it'll start hurting and things... You know, it's just not comfortable. It even affects my back standing on the side of a hill like that, right? So how much more is an uneven word affecting us? When we walk on this craggy rock, this, the, the, this, it's rugged and it's rough. And it's, who wants to take a walk on that? You know, we're going to, on our, on our cruise next month, we're going to go to several places. And it says uh, medium walking and things like that. We strayed away from the ones that said, well, I don't forget to how strenuous we strayed away from that but some of them are going to be a little tough to walk on we would much rather walk on a level plane wouldn't we with a smooth surface that's for me not concrete <laughs> concrete's my enemy i don't like walking on concrete like yeah not cobblestones <laughs> so that's a real good picture there because the undeceitful word produces a rough rugged and an uneven walk and god wants us to tread about and we'll get there a little bit and talk about it but tread about in our life at rest and at peace and at comfort. 
Uh, I would love to be able to walk miles. I, Norma, I know you do, but I'd love to be able to do that. And it's just because it's artificial knee, it's a little tough, but I know I can. I just, I'm getting my body in shape where I can. I would love to hike. I think that would be so awesome mm -hmm. to be able to hike and to be able to go down a path with, with no, you know, a, what I would do is I would go on the path that was already walked out for me. I wouldn't say, well, I'm just going to start climbing up this mountain. You know, no, that'd be tough. And so the Lord is helping us. So this is, it's this, this rough, rugged, uneven, it's not the true rock. It's not the Petra, the Petra in the book of Revelation, the rock here, uh, the, the rock that we're to walk on is a, it's, it's a, it's, it literally says clear. It means lofty. Uh, Kola comes from another word, the rock of division. So we can see the only rock that will stand and hold you up is the Petra rock, and that was Jesus. Jesus told Peter, and he, he, his name was Peter, which is the rock. But when you look at that meaning of the rock, it's a piece of the rock. So Peter was an apostle, right? So his revelation that he gave was a piece. It wasn't the whole rock. It was his understanding, his perception of what Jesus did. But when you look at Jesus, when he said this rock, he translated out and it says massive rock. Well, he was the massive rock. He was the massive revelation that that's revealed in the book of Revelation. So Peter was Petros and switches a piece of the rock and Jesus is the rock upon which the church is built. So if you're going to be, if you're going to call yourself the church, you know, that's what the Bible uses for the church. But church, the church is all people, right? Everybody is the church. So again, that's why I don't use the word Christianity anymore. I'm not a Christian. I'm a believer. I'm a follower of Christ our life. I'm a follower of what Jesus did for us. I'm a follower of the one and true God. There's only one God. There's no other God. There's just all kinds of perceptions of God. So this is the rock that we need to follow. Furthermore, again, for those who are new on Facebook looking at this, the word for brimstone is theion, and it translates to be sulfur. The root word to that, which sulfur is a cleaning agent, the root word comes from theios, -E theios, which is godliness, and then the root word of that is theos, which is God. So we're travelling them, travelling them in birth with the word of God. The fire and brimstone is the word of God. That's all it is. But you can't travel them in birth with the word of God unless you have been anointed to do so. And we saw where the word anointed means consecrate. That means you've seen something. You don't do to be. You see something. When you go to college, did you go to college, Sandy? When you Okay, when you went to kindergarten. <laughs> now, when you went to high school... You really didn't have to work. Now, you thought it was work. You thought studying was working, and you thought writing was working. But what you were doing, worship means ascertain, seek, and desire to know. So you were seeking and desiring to know your subject, and then you did a term paper, and that's the praise part of it. That's telling the story. It's telling what you learn. So what we do when we study the show ourselves approved is really not a labor to become something. We're studying to show ourselves that we're approved, right? And so that's important for us. And so to do that, you've got to be anointed. You had to see somebody. Uh, you had to see what somebody did, and that was Jesus, and that was God in Jesus. In the Old Testament, they were taught the operation of God, but they didn't put faith in it, and God was disappointed in that. And the New Testament, Jesus came to, to be the operation of God, but people didn't put faith in it because they were, they were given the wrong explanation of what Jesus did. Paul gave the right, right explanation. I know he did. John did in the book of Revelation, gave the right explanation, which should have really made man free to tread about in this life uh, out of the most holy place around and the cool of the day to tread about the spirit. But religion came in and had their mixture and everything else and robbed us of that. But I'm telling you, today, we, we it's, it's changing. It's changing. Uh, so the word torment, then, is the same word as travail. It's, we're travailing. See, we come to people and we travail them in birth by feeding them a nugget here, a nugget there. And if they can take more, give them a big rock and then a, a boulder and, and just continue to feed them and feed them and feed them. I got a, a text, a, a Facebook message. You can see it on my Facebook page. The guy, guy posted something. He said he's just sitting here in tears. He said he's watched the, the uh, part 20 already of No Penal Substitution. And see, that's travailing the people in, de in birth. They're out here, and they're, they're, they're seeing these things. And you know what they're seeing? I knew this all my life. I can't tell you how many people tell me, 
you're preaching and Kay's preaching and teaching things that I knew a long time ago, but I was afraid and I didn't have anybody to go to. I remember when Brother Garner, he told in 1988, where the Lord began to really show him some things. And now that I know when he told that story about he was driving down the street and God told him he was going to see a tractor, I believe God was telling him that you need to let me show you what I'm really showing you, not what you think I'm showing you. Because he had a understanding, but he didn't have the complete understanding. Just like we today, we have a great understanding, but we don't yet have complete. Because when we have complete, that's, I believe that's when this mortality is going to put on immortality. I believe that. And that's why when I tell people, when they say, well, when are we going to quit being sick? What are we going to be? Well, part of that is when we quit, when we think we need something else to be healed. We need something else to have more money. Now, what we need is more understanding. And so we just keep feeding and we keep feeding and we keep feeding. But Brother Garner heard, uh, you're going to see a tractor. And so he drove for two or three miles and he never saw a tractor. And he just said, well, God, I didn't see a tractor. And, the, and God spoke to him and said, there was a tractor out in the field on the side of the road. And that was for him. We too often preachers take things that God shows us and we put it on you, right? But that now that I look, I have hindsight, that was literally just for him. Because many times when God speaks to us in our perception, we think he said this when he's saying that. But I'm thankful for what Brother Garner taught us. Definitely thankful for that. But we want to learn from that. So we travail them in birth by feeding the truthful word of God until they awaken to who they are really are and that's my job is to feed and as i feed for you and then it's awakening me but it's awakening you too and no matter what we think uh if you went back 10 years ago if you went back five years ago if you went back three years ago i think you would have to say you've awakened more and more and more is that true tree of life it really is so these people who are drinking of the wine of the love of god not the wrath of god are people who are eating the message that burns up all religious imaginations. That's what we're doing. We're not dealing with lying, cheating, cussing, all that other kind of stuff. We're just bringing ourselves to the, to, together as a body, and we listen out on Facebook and to all the teachers that God's led us to, and we're letting it burn away all that false imaginations that's really been making us sick, that's been hurting us bad. So uh, those imaginations came from the breath or understanding from sense realm teachers and those strongholds that come from believing that lie it's all being burned up how long is it going to take i don't know just keep exposing yourself to the fire keep exposing yourself to messengers that preach the good news well pastor i have real problems well keep exposing yourself i don't want to hear about your problems i don't want to you know what now if there's problems i need to know about i'll help you with it but if if you're like Norma and you eat gallons of ice cream every week, she just needs to keep feeding on what will make her not want that anymore, right? <laughs> she don't look like she eats gallons of ice cream, though. <laughs> the other day, oh, I was at the kid's birthday party, my boy's birthday party, and they were having ice cream, and I thought, I kept hearing, you can just have a little bit. <laughs> I preach too much about ice cream, yeah. <laughs> but that's all right. I don't want any. So God's passionate longing for man is to realize what the cross revealed, which is the love and the nature of God. That's all it revealed. Crucified, died, very quick, and raised the seed. All of that revealed the love of God. Now let's go to Revelation 14, 19. 14, 19. There's Mr. Kent. He's always faithful to be here, isn't he? Kent Lindsay. I, I like your post, Kent. And the... Th and the angel thrust in his sickle into his, the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press, of the, uh, wine press of the wrath of God. And that just sounds so scary, doesn't it, when you just read it like that? But we're, we're there. These are a first group, group of people. These are first group people who experienced this. And now we see a second group. We had a first group, a first group of people that I showed you here. But now there's this second group of people experiencing the same thing. They've heard the message. They're beginning to grow in the message. An explosion's taking place to them, and they're beginning to experience the same thing. Uh, they're, they're really open to this level of understanding. Rod, have you met many people there? There are, some, there are a lot of people, and more and more today. I hear talk, people talk about on Facebook how they've never seen such a day where there's so many people that are waking up. You know, and I say this on Facebook, you know, when you wake up, don't be mad 
I see some of them using words about the church and saying stuff that's just not representative of who we are. And don't be mad. Don't be mad at the preachers that, you know, because we were there. And we're not, this generation that we're listening to are not the ones that propagated the lie. It happened a long time ago. And we've all believed the lie. You know, so it's, it's all right. I, I get upset sometimes. and I say, well, why did they do this? Why did they change these words? Well, I know why. So I needed to quit saying that. But I'm, I'm, def, I'm definitely not against the Catholic Church. You know, I'm not against the people. I'm, I, I love the priest and uh, the Pope. They all, I just, just like me, I, I needed to wake up. And all I know is they need to wake up. They're not doing these things on purpose today. I don't think they are, you know. And so they, they are really opened up. So to see some are still dragging their feet, still happy with a sense realm understanding. I have friends like that, that very close friends. And they just, they're still happy the way it is, but they're just, they will wake up after a while. You know, this morning I didn't want to get out of bed, but I knew I had to come. <laughs> I could have stayed in bed real easily this morning. But uh, I know this rainy weather it makes you want to sleep. But uh, they're going to eventually be cast into the wine of the wrath of God. Everybody's going to experience the love of God. But I don't want that to be after this body ceases to be able to hold me, do you? I want it for here because this is where God wants me. And so we want to look next in Revelation chapter 15. It's been taught from a fear perspective. Uh, it's been taught to scare people. It's been taught to control people. It's been taught to get people to get saved so they can add people to their box of saved people. Brother Garner used to say it's like saving pop bottle talks. How many do you have? I've got 25. How many do you have? I've got 1,000. What are you doing with them? I don't know. I'm just collecting them. <laughs> You know, it's just, it's like the goal of a religious system is to get as many people as they can in their building. But what are you doing with them when you get them? You putting them to work? Mostly, don't they? You, you teach them to give tithe, right? You teach them to, to work in the Sunday school class and you all have your turn and all that. You know, there's nothing wrong with working in a, in a church setting. But if you're not teaching them who they are, you're not bringing them to a place where they can grow up and go out and really gather in the sheaves really go out and teach people who, then you're really not doing nothing you're just collecting people and we don't want to do that and it's very evident here i don't collect people <laughs> so so the the wrath of god then is a truly wonderful and marvelous great thing the, and we talked about that last week where i said it's marvelous and it's wonderful and it's great well i thought it was scary and something you don't want to experience and that you hope the rapture takes place before that all takes place, right? Yeah. You know, left behind. You don't want to be here when all that takes place. So it's not, something must be wrong because if you see the left behind books and you read it and you read the late great planet Earth, it was not wonderful. It was not marvelous and it was not great. But sometimes I think people think it's really going to be cool. You know, I got saved. I'm up in heaven. Just like this scripture torment them with the wrath of God and the, and the presence of of angels and the lamb, I thought, why would that be hell and Jesus and messengers watching that? It just didn't make sense, Rod. But yet there are people that are like that and they're going to be so glad that I got my ticket, ha, 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 and you didn't. Well, what if that's your grandkids? You know, what if that was your husband or your wife? Are you going to be happy then? You know, but people act that way. So I want to read, and I'm going to read this from my translation. <clears throat> so just look at me because you don't want to follow along. It'll be a little confusing. Revelation 5.1 says, And I considered, perceived, and had understanding by a supernatural disclosing, and this is John, this is what he sees, an uncovering of God's love, life, character, and nature seen in man. Father God and God's love in man is, is big, marvelous, made manifest, in other words, could be seen, and greater than my mouth can express in natural words. Remember, John was caught up in the, in the third heaven. He saw things that were unlawful to speak. He didn't know how to articulate it to where they could understand it. You know, sometimes uh, I've talked to people who say they're atheists. And I, I tell them, I know there's a God. And they say, why? And I said, because I experienced the love. I feel it. I feel the presence of God in my life. If there was no God... I can't imagine what it would be like. I can't imagine what it's like to not believe in God. But what's cool about God is he's chasing those not believers too, right? He's pouring out his love. When one of my children just uh, said that he was an atheist, 
and after I had a little crying fit and all that several years ago, then you know what the Lord told me? He was always my son before you. And so I began to pray the blessings of the Lord upon him. I said, Lord, just I, I believe for a prosperous life for my son. I believe for finances for him. And I believe there will be a day that he'll say, you know what? I didn't get this by the works of my own hands. I believe he knows it now. I really do. And so these men were, and when we use the word men, there's no gender implied ladies. These people were mature messengers. Arch, an archangel is a mature in understanding. That's what it means. A first in rank is a mature in understanding. And they're in full possession of the understanding of the operation of God. They function with ability as anointed priests from a relation of rest, for in themselves is a clear understanding of the accomplished, concluded, and perfect, all-inclusive work of Jesus Christ, being God's passionate love. The great slaughter, the removal of the old, worn-out condition of humanity that took place in him as the final sacrifice, which was falsely needed by man. So when you talk about a great slaughter, it's not of people, it's that false condition that's in man. I call it the death estate. Everybody of Adam, who, who lived as Adam, they were not that way. They were not sinners. They had not lost the life of God, but because they believed they were as or just a mere human, then they lived this way. Verse 7, it says, And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels. Now, beast here is a mature messenger of the seven angels, the seven, uh, seven golden vials full of the love of God, right? Not the wrath of God. This is the King James here, though. Are you in 15 or 5? 15. 15. Five Did I say 5? No. Well, you weren't supposed to be following along with me anyways. It would have been confusion there, too. <laughs> but yeah, 15, 1. 15, 7, and this is the King James Version. And one of the four <laughs> beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And what that says is one of the awakened messengers that was raised from the lower realm living of thinking. And as I did this this morning, mine was Gary Garner. Wasn't it? Yours was Gary Garner. He was awakened, but he didn't have full revelation, but he had much more than we'd ever experienced before. And so it says, uh, was raised from the lower realm living and thinking out of the character and nature of Christ. They were ones who came later as mature messengers to speak as the voice of one. Every aspect of crucified died very quick and raised and seated of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. His passion, his long love of God that's forever world without end. So guess what? Brother Garner's here. Brother Garner's here. We're all one, are we not? So our, our messenger that helped wake us up is with us today. He's just in the spirit. And he's saying, sick him. <laughs> I believe that. And we've had many messengers. That's why I love that picture the church bought me years ago. It's a picture of a young man up preaching with a Bible in his hand, and all behind him is Jesus and God and the Apostle Paul and other people that had gone before him. And they were just saying, yes, yes, yes. And I believe we have a great cloud of witnesses around us today that's saying yes to this message. I really believe that. So, Revelation 16, it uses the word vile, and it's used one time in the Old Testament. And the Septuagint, which is the Greek rendering, uh, it was the, the uh, chalice or the cup on the table of showbread, which held the bread and wine. And we know bread and wine always represents the death, the burial, the resurrection. It's, it's the revelation of Jesus' redemptive work. So we are the seven vials. Seven is the number of maturity and perfection, right? So they reveal the compassionate love of our almighty God who's pouring out seven individual revelations to help us. The book is one revelation, but these vials are given us seven, seven aspects of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ that help us. They reveal, they reveal this love. So this was Jesus' uh, I can't even say the word this morning hard. Apoloptic you ever do that where you just can't pronounce a word? <laughs> Forget it. It reveals the revealing, the unveiling, and the uncovering. Each one of these reveals the, is the revealing, the unveiling, the uncovering. It's something we knew at one time that we forgot. Something we knew but that we forgot. So at the birth of each of us and every individual, we were born with a mind of Christ. I believe that. Because there's only one spirit, so we were born with a spirit. We came with a, with a brain with a blank slate, if you would. It had the ability to keep the, make the body 
grow, it had the ability to continue a life source. A baby has everything unless they're born with some kind of defect in their brain. That brain's able to sustain them, I believe, for eternity. But then there was a bunch of stuff put in there that shouldn't have been put in there. They were raised by parents that had all kinds of belief systems, all kinds of attitudes, all kinds of hang-ups in their life. And that, that happened to their children. I have grandkids that and we have nieces and nephews that we know if they were born in a different family, they would be they would have a completely different life. Anybody know people that way? Completely different life. So these we were we were intended to be given the truthful word of God, which is able to it says save ourselves, but it's able to I would say if we had the truthful word of God from birth our souls, which is our whole being, would be regenerating constantly, constantly regenerating, and there would be no weapon formed against us that could prosper. I believe that with all my heart. So we want to see these aspects, this passionate love here. So as we read the following verses, remember the word angel means messengers, and all people are messengers. Some carry the truthful word, some carry the deceitful word. The deceitful word is what's got mixture in it. The seven vowels as we'll see, all represent the understanding of false things in man's awareness, and Jesus destroyed that in his passion. In uh, 1 John 3, 8, in Hebrew 2, 14, it talks about, for this purpose was the Son of Man manifest to destroy, and it said, him that had the power of death, and of course they said the devil. And also one of them says the works of, they said the devil, but it's actually the law, and it's actually what Adam released in his unbelief. And so Jesus came to destroy that, and that's why I believe that when Jesus drew all into him, he drew everything that hindered man into him and destroyed it. He destroyed the false perception of God. He destroyed the, the for man's thinking they needed a sacrifice. He destroyed the religious system uh, mindset that you had to do to be. And he destroyed the degenerate nature activity that was working in man because of man leaving the realm of spirit and living by the sense realm. If you live by the sense realm, you're going to have a sense of lack in every realm of life, right? Physical, uh, spiritual, because you think you lack spiritually, mentally, financially, and there's another one. <laughs> but it, it, it will destroy that. Socially. So that, huh? Socially. Socially, yeah. So there was a sense of lack in that realm, and that's where man has suffered ever since then. But it was a power before the cross because there was nobody there teaching them the truth. Jesus came to show us the truth, and it's no longer a power. You can rise up and be free from all this stuff. We all can. And that's what we're doing. So uh, the word destroy means abolish, cease, cumber, deliver, destroy, do away, make of not, none, without effect, loosen, bring to naught, put away, vanish away, and make void. That's a lot of explanation in it. Because if you don't get this one, well, we'll put another word there too. It's cardigeo in the Greek, and that's what that means. So the first vowel is in Revelation 16.2. You want to turn there. Revelation 16.2. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. So the phrase noisome and grievous sore, it pictures the fruit of someone who's, who's living a, a mistaken identity. And it is noisome, and it is grievous, and we've all borne it. We've borne the effects of thinking that we're just human. We have borne the effects of thinking that we're sinners saved by grace. We have borne the effects of, of uh, feeling separate from God. We've borne the effects of us teaching that, well, all this is happening, you've been punished because, right? And that is grievous and it's noisome and it's terrible. You know, you ever been around somebody that's had a long-term illness and they get pretty noisome about it? <laughs> you know, I had a year of suffering in my back several years ago, 1996, it was just really bad. And I got kind of noisome about it. I said, everybody, how you doing? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> you know, walk around, oh, my back. You know, after a while, you get where you don't want to be around them because they're so noisome about their problem all the time. And, wow, we could go to church sometimes and hear all the testimonies. And we used to call it telling us they're testing and moaning about it for a while. <laughs> right? We moan about, moan about those things. So uh, <clears throat> this phrase, it pictures the fruit of someone who is living out of a mistaken identity as a sickness. It is a sickness. It's the sickness that we really needed to be healed from. 
wasn't so much we needed to be healed from cancer and diabetes and colds and allergies. We needed to be healed from the sickness of living out of the power of a carnal mind, thinking that we're just a sinner saved by grace, thinking that we're separate. That's, that's sick to be that way, to think that you're separate from God. It's sick to live out on the streets when you have a family and you have a home and you have people. You know, that's, that is a sickness. So this is a sore, this is a sore into sickness. And Jesus identified with this to reveal us that there's only, there, there are only sinners in, it, in our mind, just in our, in our thinking process. Colossians 1.27 says, And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies, where? Not enemies from God, enemies in your mind. I'm thankful that they left that in there in the King James. You were just an enemy in your mind. You know, that was it. By wicked works. And what does the word wicked mean? Remember? Rest. Restless. Restless. I know you know it. Restless. Uh, they, they were restless, and so they produced, they never entered into the rest of God. So they were always trying to be at rest with God. I've met people who are married before, and particularly the woman in most instances is always trying to please the husband, not realizing that he's pleased with you already. He already cares for you. He, he already loves you. And it says, yet now hath he reconciled. So Paul was explaining to the Colossians church that Jesus reconciled us out of that. And the reconciliation is always for us, not God, right? God had nothing against man ever, but man needed to be reconciled. And reconcile is an accounting term. And so he's, he's done that by showing us some things. He came to show us the love of God for man. And if we would have figured it out, then we wouldn't have been restless anymore. We would have entered into the rest of God and not done all those restless works. And what's a restless work, Rod? It's just dead works. All right? In Hebrews, it says to repent from dead works. In other words, quit that. It's producing nothing. It's producing nothing but death. You know, it's like I always use with a woman trying to get pregnant. You know, there's something wrong. She's not able to get pregnant, so she's doing all these restless works. You know, she's taking her temperature. She's telling her husband when to come home, taking pills that sometimes produce five or six kids when you wanted one. You know, that's all a restless work, and it's no fun. It's not making love. But once she just quits and makes love with her husband, enjoys her husband, after they probably adopted a child, she gets pregnant. So that's proof that she could have all along but because of her, of her stress and her worry, it cast off the seed. And boy, we have spent most of our religious lives in stress and worry, haven't we? I know you have, Rod. <laughs> we all have. No. So, did you look up that word malignant? That what? Did you look up the word malignant? Malignant? Malignant score? No. Did it say malignant? Well, you're looking at your translation. Uh, it says malignant. Yeah, malignant is something that spreads. Yeah. Yeah, if you have a, a, a malignant tumor, it's got cancer in it, right? And it spreads. So that's what that would be. So they translated that malignant. Yeah, malignant was, is, I mean, if it's, it's not just spreading, but I mean, it's. It's unto it's death. Not. It's unto death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. So, uh, let me go. So if from birth we were taught these truths, it would have changed our lives. So the first of all is God in Jesus as he identified with himself uh, with that consequential degenerate nature activity. That's what the first of all is. Uh, he abolished it, meaning he ceased it. He made void. It doesn't exist anymore. He destroyed all the power of a false identity. And he explained it through the apostle Paul. God talked and explained it, but yet we didn't get to hear it. Second vial pictures man, man's death estate dying. Man did not die there, right? I've said this many times when Jesus said in the King James, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men into me. Well, he didn't draw all men, you know. When he died, there was no man around him that died, but it was the estate of man. It was the condition of man that he destroyed. So we, in a sense, we were not there. You and I wasn't there when that took place. And the people that were alive were still standing there while he was dying on the cross, and they didn't drop dead. But it was the state, that's what we've got to understand, that false identity and that false belief system that God was an angry God. He destroyed that in his earth walk, did he not? He blessed people. He didn't come as a God that they had to bow down to. And that's why I believe the messenger in the book of Revelation that they bowed down to, he said, don't, don't bow down to me, don't worship me, worship God. 
And that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be ascertaining, seeking the desire more of God so we can tell the true story and not the undeceitful story. So the second vial here, Revelation 16.3, excuse me, it says, And the second angel, second messenger, poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of dead men, and every living soul died in the sea. Now, sea represents the mass of humanity, right? It always represents people. So Jesus' death revealed that death lodged in man as a death consciousness. That's, that's where it was at. It was a death consciousness. And he identified with that confusion of that death consciousness, the revealing uh, that swallowed up the mythological lie of the death co consciousness. You know, we, we still to this day, most people think that we have to die someday. Which that's a point of, they think it's a point of much for man to die than the judgment, where it actually says, you know, there was an appointment made by Adam, by what he did to produce death, but the decision was made that Jesus was going to come and swallow all that up. And Jesus was going to reveal the truth to us. Then the third vial was the destruction of confusion. And where did confusion come from in Jesus? He identified with man's confusion. The physical, physical picture of the crown of thorns that was put on his head. A crown is always a mentality. The sun clothed woman in the book of Revelation, she's got a crown of 12 stars around her. It's a revelation of crucified, died very quick and raised and seated, and man involved in all that. So this crown that he bore was the crown of thorns that was released in man's uh, cutting himself off of the knowledge of God and its religion. So it says, the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of waters, and they became blood. It had to do with the destruction of Babylon. It had to do with the destruction of the mixture, the religious mixture. Uh, again, it said, travail in birth with the wine of the wrath of God without mixture. And so when did Jesus identify with confusion? He did that on the cross. His father never forsook him, but he was confused. And he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because did not man believe they were forsaken? Have you ever, after the cross, have you ever in your life thought that God forsook you? Sure. You know, it can be all kinds of stuff. It can be loss of jobs. It can be loss of loved ones. Every one of us in here experienced loss of loved ones lately. And if we didn't know who we are, if we didn't know God, we would be saying, why did God take our loved one? Why is, I hear it all the time, why is God allowing this? Why is God doing this? Well, that's just a picture of confusion because we think God is in control of everything and God is not. God has done everything that he's ever going to do. He's given us all power, all authority. He's given us rule over this planet. God is in us as spirit. He made a physical planet. God doesn't need a physical planet. God is spirit. But he made a physical planet. He made a creation for man to enjoy. The, the planets out there, the stars, the, the moon, all that is for us to enjoy and to explore. This planet is for us to enjoy and explore. There's so much that we haven't seen on this earth. Did you know that? There's things that people have no idea of this earth. It's a place of beauty. But yet we're always wanting to fly away to go to some Disneyland planet called heaven. <laughs> you know, and we think that's what God wants for us. Well, that's kind of silly when you look at this earth and see how beautiful it is and how marvelous it is. Have I told you about my banana trees? <laughs> I, you know, I just, I, I have my tropical plants out there and I have other plants because I love God's creation. My banana trees are putting on bananas for the first time ever in five years and they're just beautiful. Donna and I looked at it today, one of them is this long. It's got bananas here, bananas here, bananas here, and it's still making bananas. Creation just amazes me. How can that happen in Oklahoma? Yeah. Takes a guy with a green thumb. <laughs> no, no, I told somebody the other day, it's not me, it's just creation. It's it's God. But I I but I, I wanted that. I wanted I, I've always said I want mine to put bananas on. I desire that. So in a sense, I took dominion over that. Last year I didn't cut two or three of them down. I dug them up, planted them in the garage because I wanted bananas and it worked. You know, so we have all things that pertain to life and godliness. We know all things, and literally we could take dominion on this earth with what we know, if we would, we really, if, if we really would. And so God never forsook Jesus, ever. Uh, it, it was a mythological lie. And again, Jesus was identifying with a confusion that came from the mythological lie. You ever felt confused when they said, you know, you said the sinner's prayer and everything, but they still told you were a sinner saved by grace? <laughs> Wasn't that kind of confusing? Yeah. Oh, I thought I was gonna be a Christian. Yeah, but you're still a sinner saved by grace. And you'll always sin. That's a mythological lie. 
The fourth vial was the former rulers, the former rulers. We know the sun, moon, and stars uh, picture religious systems. It pictures political systems. It picture, pitch, uh, pictures medical systems. It pictures the financial system, and it pictures the social realm. Those are false rulers. We're supposed to be ruled by the people that's involved in the kingdom of God. This earth is, right? That, that know they're righteous. So it says, And the fourth angel poured out the vial upon... Uh, yeah, the fourth angel poured out the, his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. That's the King James Version there. So Jesus identified with any false perceived power that ruled man. And at that time, the number one false perceived power was what Adam had released, and then how that worked in man. At that time, they were under the control of the Roman Empire, were they not? And that was a power to them. They were fearful of that. But the greatest false power that they were under was the power of living out of their sense realm. And so Jesus came to reveal that there's only one power. Our God is uh, omnipotent. Our God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's all-knowing. So there's only one power, and he is all-powerful. And when we understand that, then guess what that will do? That will destroy our wrong beliefs that there's something else powerful in our life. To the point that if we go to a doctor and they give a diagnosis to us, it does not become a power. I tell people constantly when they tell me they, their cancer, their diabetes, I just say, if you don't mind me saying this, don't own that. Don't identify with that. It's not yours. It doesn't belong to you. And too many people identify with their ailments. My bad back, my bad me, my whatever it is, and we talk about it like it's ours and it's not ours. So um, he identified with that. He revealed that there's only one power. These, these falsely perceived powers were the consequences of Adam feeding from the wrong tree. And I'll tell you this today, the political, the financial, the religious, the medical, the social realm, they don't have a power over you. But you know what we've done? We've been raised all our life to depend on them. Those that went to church most of their life, their family put them in a certain denomination and gave that denomination a power over us. They put us in the Sunday school classes and let them teach that denominational belief. They set us in front of the pastors and fed us that, right? And they fed us a sin conscious, so it became a power. The very first time I did something wrong, I felt like I was a sinner, right? I went to, I, I snuck off and went to the sock hop and I felt condemned for it. I went to a movie. And it caused me to, both of those caused me to lie to my mom. So I was a sinner for lying and I was a sinner for having fun. That, that's just when I'm a young teenager. Yeah. And then there was a time that I stole a pack of cigarettes from 7-Eleven. I worked there, not cigarettes, but cigars, Swisher Sweets. I'll never forget that. Mm -hmm. And I called my friend Bruce Hibbard, the pastor's son, and I was the associate pastor's son. And I said, hey, man, I got some cigars. You want to smoke them? So we went under that bridge on Agnew. I don't know why we went under a bridge. But on Agnew and 59th Street, and we went under that. Well, we didn't want it. God, we were hiding from God is what we were doing. <laughs> but we smoked all five of those. 16 years old, smoked all five of those. We both were so, so sick. It was unbelievable. But we had a sin conscious there, right? And you know what I remember the most as a child? Things that I did wrong. Do you? You want to tell them wrong? <laughs> but I do. I remember. I remember the things that I that that I remember that sin consciousness stuff. Yeah. I, I don't have a lot of memories of feeling righteous. That I don't have a lot of memories of feeling that I was right with God. You know, and the older I got, the more I struggled with it. Fortunately, Donna wasn't in a religious system until she came to our church at sixteen. You know, and she had a marvelous experience because she wasn't raised. Now she was got it some from osmosis because she was by around grandparents and other people. There's something inside of them, but see, that something inside of me should not have made me feel condemned. Maybe I needed to feel conviction. That's all right. So I said, you know what? This is really not who I am. Didn't you ever feel that when you were younger? This is really not who I am. There was, there was this, there was, but what that was, it was the love of God always bringing you up higher and higher and higher. When I tell my children, this is not what Richmonds do. I'm not punishing them and I'm not condemning them. I'm saying, listen here, baby, you're a Richmond. 
And we don't do those things. That's an exhortation, isn't it? It's, it's not a punishment. So that this false identity from government and everything else is a lie. There is no power except for what we give, or give it a power. I can give the IRS power over my life. I can give the government power. You know how we give the government power? Because we, we, we're so worried about which one's going to take care of us. We're worried about which president that we need and which congressman that we need. It's been a, a nasty fight for years. And we have given them so much power. If you don't think you have, then just tell me how many times it's made you upset. How many times it's made you sleepless. How many times have you worried? You know, I can tell you this. The election year is the toughest year for sales. It's the toughest year for prearranging funerals. That, that last year before election year, because why? Because of fear. People are afraid they're not going to have money. I've had people tell me, well, we'll wait, wait until after I see who's going to get elected, and then I'll draw money out and I'll prearrange my funeral. It's come from fear. It's called it causes uh, recessions because people won't spend money. Several years ago, uh, something was declared it was going to happen and everything, and oh, they were talking about the greatest recession since the depression. Remember that? And so Don and I decided we're going to quit spending money, quit go to movies and. You know, we're going to save our money. And all of a sudden, the Lord just spoke to me inside. You're causing the recession by not spending. See, we're supposed to spend. Yeah. I got an email the other day, and I really liked it. This guy bought him a brand new car, a really nice sport car. And somebody said, well, think of all the starving children that could have fed. And he came back with a really good answer. And he said, well, I don't know the number. He but said he's, how many. Oh, how many. Yeah, how many of the starving children that could have fed. Uh, he said, I don't know the number, but I know I fed the people that mined the copper for the wire in it, their family. And I know I fed the family of the people that transported the car to me. And I know I fed the family of the people that made the car. And I know I, and he just went down this long list. I fed the family that makes tires. I fed the family that, uh, that, I'm trying to think more, so sells it, right? He fed, I thought that was a great answer. <laughs> it was a great answer. It was a great there. answer because you know, people always say, well, look at all the money they wasted on that yeah. car. You know. So, so we're, we're controlled by that. We're controlled by, well, you, you shouldn't really have much. You know, well, if we don't have much and we don't make a lot of money, then there is going to be a recession. There's going to be a, a depression. And then we're going to have to... Uh, become a slave to them. And guess what? It's very difficult to get out of those systems when you become a slave to them. Yeah. Our friend Ronnie and Don, we were talking about it the other day, once you get hooked up to the medical society, I mean, your whole week is doctor's appointments and doctor's appointments and pills and drugs. and They take all your money and they, they rape the insurance company for thousands of dollars. You get involved in the government taking care of you. You get on food stamps. You get on... Uh, I don't know what they call it today, but it's welfare. You get on welfare, you you get child care for your kids, and if you make a dollar a raise, you lose it all. Yeah. So a dollar raise doesn't replace any of that. So it's a trap. My my poor my youngest daughter, she's she's had to be involved in that, and she's trying to better herself. So she got a job, and I think they were giving her fifteen dollars an hour. Next thing you know, they cut her off of her. 13, yeah, 13. They cut her off of her food stamps. They cut her off of her her uh, daycare. daycare well. And her food and her daycare was much more. And you know what she had to do? She had to take a cut and pay. Yeah. Had to cut, take a cut and pay because she wasn't going to be able to make it. And I don't disdain people on, that get help, but I'm just telling you, the systems of the earth come with strings, and they're actually ropes around your neck, yeah. and they don't yeah. want you to prosper. The, you know, uh, I, I watched a story that I'm not going to get to finish this, I'm sure. But I watched a story on, for, <laughs> you know, Donna, get back to it. I watched a story on, on food the other day, and, and, and they were talking, and they were interviewing doctors about how it's really the food that's causing our diseases. But several doctors said, you know what? When we went to college, we were taught how to practice medicine. Yeah. We were not taught how to tell you how to eat. All we know what to do is tell you to get on a low-fat diet which never works anyways by it. But that's all they said. We don't, we're not here to tell you the truth. We're here to treat you, right? We're here to sell you chemo. 
We're here to, but, but if we, if they would tell the truth. So I'm just telling you, these systems, they enslave you. You get in a religious system, you're enslaved, right? They promote fear. Okay, the fifth vial. The fifth vial uh, is the false rest. It's What is the false rest it's doing to be? It's like the girl doing to get pregnant. That's a false, that's a false way of getting pregnant. God never said if you want to have a child, you got to work and labor. It's not going to be easy. You know, all you do is enjoy one another. You make love. You have fun. It's a natural process. You're at rest. And if there's nothing wrong with you biologically, you're going to produce a child. So uh, it's the fifth file is a false rest being destroyed. Revelation 16:10, the King James. And the fifth messenger poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. And his kingdom was full of darkness, so it wasn't righteous as peace and joy, right? Religion, that kingdom of religion doesn't produce righteous peace and joy. The political system, none of them do. And they gnawed their tongues for pain. Been there. Verse 11. And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not their deeds. So Christ, the many-membered man, was raised up out of that worn-out way of life and awakened to their perfect oneness. That's what Jesus showed us in his passion. He, he rose all of us back up. The resurrection wasn't just Jesus. The resurrection was Christ the many-membered man. He, Christ the many-membered man appeared as a gardener. Christ the many-membered man, according to Butch, appeared as a short little bald fat boy, <laughs> fat man, talking to the two people on the road to Emmaus. He appeared on the seashore and they didn't know who he was. The only time they knew him as Jesus was in the, with the disciples because they needed to see Jesus. Nick, uh, uh, who was it needed to see the scar his hands? Oh, Thomas. Yeah, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. So uh, once we understand the raised and seated aspect of redemption, it reveals that we were always at rest with God. Raised means he took our ability to come out of the five cents realm, the dust realm, and to be seated means at rest with God. Very few people were at rest with God before, and very few people still are at rest with God after the work of the cross. And yet we are at perfect rest with God. We just were not taught it. Mm. Man, I would love to have my pastor point his finger at us, all of us, and say, guys, I want to tell you something. God is happy with you. God loves you. There's nothing you can do that can separate you from God. None of that matters one thing about God's condition with you. And the only reason it matters to you is because we have wrongly taught you a sin conscious. We've wrongly taught you that you're always falling short. I would have loved to have heard that as a young man. It would have changed my, my life. So the problem was we just didn't know. Man was always at rest with God, but we lost our awareness. The sixth vial had to do with the religious system drying up. And the revelation comes from all mixtures swallowed up and it's destroyed. Revelation 16, 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now, I looked up the word kings there, and it says foundational power, and also the root word of it says treading the walk of the new day. Treading the walk of the new day. Are we doing that? This new day, this new revelation, are we treading about in this earth with that revelation and that understanding? I know we're practicing it, but I still sure know that there's some areas that we're not. But see, this king, and it comes from the east. What comes from the east? The sun comes from the east, right? The revelation of the new day comes from the east, and it spreads all the way across. And so God wants us to walk out of that in perfect rest. Jesus in his passage and his, his passion identified with this confusion so once we understand and we're no longer confused, then it signifies it's a new day for us. His mercies are new every morning. But I'm not just talking about a 24-hour period. I'm just saying we live in the morning awareness of God. We live and we tread about our life in this new day experience. And that's what we've got to practice doing. Well, how do we do it? We just do it by faith. We get up tomorrow morning and say, I'm going to live out of who I am. I'm going to live in the heavens. Father, help me to stay aware of you all day long. Isn't that awesome? Yes. So it's, it's, it's prepared. The river, the confusion, the religious system, and they are drying up. The religious systems are drying up. It may not look like it, but I'm telling you, it is. There are millions of people that are waking up, and they're not feeding from that stuff anymore. 
But there again, I want to say to you guys on the internet that's watching this, you must not get angry. Don't attack the church system. Don't attack Christianity. Don't attack other religions. There are brothers. There are sisters. And we were in that same place and we were awakened. So we have no right to turn around and attack them. We're supposed to turn around and hand out bread and, bread and wine. And I see so many people that are angry today on the internet because of what happened. But you know what? Bottom line, we have to blame ourselves. Because like Paul told uh, Timothy, he said, a, a workman, you know, if you're going to study the word and you're going to learn and going to feed, you won't be made to feel ashamed if you'll study and show yourself approved. Mm -hmm. If I would have studied the truth word a long time ago, then I would have never fallen prey to any of that teaching. Mm -hmm. I would have never sat under it. That, that teacher didn't make you sit there and listen to him. You chose to, or you were born in that way. But you needed to come to a place where you, you couldn't, it wasn't doing anything for you. And thankfully, that's what happened to me and Donna. We finally come to a place where we said, we can't take this anymore. Can't take how we've been treated. We can't take, you know, and we didn't know what it was. But Brother Garner came into our path. And I'm thankful for Judy and Ginger Lemons and Judy Vandenberg that introduced us to Brother Garner. And that, that, that's who we needed. And I believe in my heart, when you get tired of something, there's always going to be a person to help you. There's always a Melchizedek priesthood around you somewhere. And it may just be that person that you've been rejecting all your life too. You know, there are people that I love that don't want to hear a thing that I have to say because it goes against their religious system. But I mean, they're, when they're waking up, they're going to say, you know, that's, uh, this seems like what Roy, or may, I wonder if Roy could help me. And guess what? We're being prepared for that. I believe that with all my heart. Okay, the seventh vow. Revelation 16, 17. And the seventh mature and understanding messenger, I'm just adding that to the King James, poured out his bow into the air, and there came a great voice to the temple, which is man of heaven, which is who we are, it's our spirit, from the throne, that's man again, saying, it is done. Have you heard that voice inside of you saying it's done? It's finished? You know, it's good to hear that. Verse 18 and there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were up on the earth. In other words, men whose senses were in, their, in the dust realm. So mighty an earthquake, and it was so great. That's a funny way to explain an earthquake, isn't it? I would have said it was terrible, wouldn't you? <laughs> there was a horrible earthquake, and it was terrible, but this says it was a great thing. So these messengers are consecrated. These messengers are, messengers are anointed. Just to repeat, uh, several months ago or almost a year ago i was writing uh, uh about for the school preparing for the school and in, in uh, houston global grace seminary and i was coming across the word anointed and i was reminded that the very first mention is how you really understood something so i was directed to go to when david was anointed with a horn of oil and i looked at the word anointed and it wasn't somebody that can give you goosebumps it wasn't somebody that can sing a song and make you cry. You know, we hear people say, oh, that preacher's so anointed. I felt so good. You know, it made me want to get up and shout. Well, that's okay. That's charismatic is what that is. But the word anointed means consecrated. And again, consecrated means you see something. The priests were consecrated. They didn't do a sacrifice. They had to see a sacrifice. And boy, I tell you what, I, that's another thing that would have been great to understand because if we had understood that, we would never fed from the dew to be tree ever. But they had to see something. So these messengers have seen the truthful word of God. They go forth disclosing and unveiling the truthful word of God with great illuminations. Isn't that what we're doing? Kay's doing it. We're doing it here. I believe there's many houses, hopefully more, that are doing that. And it says great illuminations as rumbling thunder going forth with a great commotion of proclaiming, teaching, and explaining the good news. They bring an awareness of rest. That's our job. That's what I did with Michael and Natalie is I brought a, an awareness of rest to them. And it's done a great work inside of them. So uh, when they proclaimed, they taught, explained, they caused a great commotion. And it was so great. It was like earthquakes, lightnings, and thunderings. That's what that's all about. Okay, I'm going to close here because uh, next week we'll, we'll look at the word wrath some more. And then we'll start uh, chapter 10, chapter 10. So I talked to Kay today and uh, she's going to. Do you know what the word hell means? Hell? Yeah, and I'll explain that later.
Thank you for asking them. <laughs> it's in my next pages. If I start on hell, I'll be preaching another 20 minutes. <laughs> huh? Yeah. It's good. It does away with stuff. So, But I talked with Kay, and she said she should have the last two chapters edited uh, uh, probably by Tuesday or Wednesday. And then we're going to go get the booklets printed, and we'll get a, we'll announce what the price will be for them, and we'll get them out. So we're real excited about that. So it will be this week, barring anything that happens, it will be this week. Also, some of you asked about uh, donations uh, to Tree of Life, how to do it. Uh, there's a there's a link on this will will be on here, and also there's a link on all of our YouTube videos now too that you can go to PayPal and you can make donations. So we appreciate your support. We appreciate your prayer. We we appreciate your love. I enjoy your messages, your emails, all that. We just feel like all you guys are part of our body, and we're thankful for that. So God bless you, and uh, we'll see you next week.